Hello. The Grundig 2x4 Super is an unusual video recorder of the Video 2000 format. I prefer this to some of the Philips V2000 models, both in terms of picture quality and ease of use. But like all V2000 video recorders, it can be unreliable. The 2x4 Super is probably one of the more reliable Video 2000 models, but really that's not saying much. My main machine broke down recently, so I had to repair it. That might have made an interesting YouTube video in itself, but I was actually pushed for time and the job involved far too much stress and swearing for YouTube use. So instead I've taken another machine of the same model from my storeroom. I will use this to show you some of the key points to look out for if ever you work on one of these machines. Firstly, I will show you my now fully repaired machine here. Some of the buttons are strangely labeled, particularly stop, which means pause, tape means stop, actually unlaces the tape, and cassette means eject. The markings on the very unusual remote control are also quite zany too, so I've added normal legends to make it easier to use. This remote control is an optional extra and requires a receiver to be added to the side of the machine, all very strange and Grundig-like. Even the battery in the remote control is strange. OK, before I even uh, power this thing up, we're going to have a look at the power supply. So, only two screws to take the top off. Which we'll take it on the back here. Okay, two screws out, and we can take the lid off. Here's the power supply. There's a screw to remove here, but we also have to take the bottom off in order to get the power supply out. So, one small screw there, and we can release this screening can. Now um, make a bit of space. <clears throat> One thing we need to do before we take the bottom off is take this control off which does the sharpness, picture sharpness, falls off. Now there should be four screws. You need to make sure you don't have any of the connectors plugged in along the back here because they will foul the bottom as we take the bottom off. The power supply plugs into the PCB here, but before we can take it off, due to something of a design flaw, we have to release here the uh, cord cable um, grips, which are a bit like the grips you find in the mains plug. Either take them completely off, or maybe you can get away with slacking them, slackening them. If they'd mounted a figure eight power socket on the back, they could have avoided the need for this, but a uh, bit of a design fail from Grundig there. Don't lose this component. Now with the cable free to move, we could take the power supply out. Generally speaking there, the power supply is fairly stuck along this edge. It's um, plugged into the main panel the main PCB. I think I can just about get to it there. So I usually find a little care <laughs> with a, a screwdriver just to get these connectors starting to pull off a little bit.
in theory, you should be able to just pull this out. Care where you stick your fingers because high voltages can remain on some of these components even when it's been switched off for some time. Yes, I didn't think it'd come out. So a little bit more um, encouragement underneath is required. Obviously you don't want to use force here because you could break bottom PCB and then you're done for. There we go, I think we're just about there. And then as we start to bring the uh, power supply up, we can unplug these two connectors. This one here, the lower one, may not be present in all cases. Sometimes it's linked out because that goes to a battery backup module at the back, which is, a, is either an optional extra or some sort of add-on. Now, this particular power, uh, power supply, I can see, has been worked on in the past because at least one of those components look, looks like it's been replaced. But the thing I wanted to get across here before we go any further, before you power this thing up, there are two mains filter capacitors, these two, and they absolutely must be replaced before you power this unit up if it's been sat around for any time just don't risk plugging it in with those two there's a 0 0.47 uh, it says 250 volt AC that's 400 volt DC rated and that one I believe is a 0.22 microfarad capacitor and if you plug it, plug it in they will go up in smoke uh, they give out a horrible acrid smell similar to um, the phosphorus matches and you get a lot of smoke, it's very scary, potentially dangerous. So let's replace those before we uh, do any more. Okay, so this is 0 0.47 microfarad. I'm fairly sure that one's 0 0.22, we can check on the diagram later. Let's get those removed. The components I have to replace them are modern, high quality, uh, X-rated capacitors, which means that they are safe to put across the mains. The modern components are a lot smaller than the original and so will have to fit uh, in a smaller uh, lead spacing. There's a spare hole here which is a little bit closer to the first one but still uh, they're much wider than the originals. Uh, so you'll have to bend the leads on the capacitor. Make sure you don't bend them close to the body. Okay, some other things I want to show you on this power supply. There's a set of capacitors here. Sometimes, sometimes they can fail and you can get a situation where you get a poor quality picture, stripiness through the picture. And you might think you could just fit any old capacitor in there, but these need to be low ESR capacitors. So. I'm not sure all of them are, you'd have to check the diagram to see if all of them have to be replaced with low ESR, but I would replace them with low ESR ones anyway. Uh, and I can see someone in the past has changed this one already. Um, possibly not with a low ESR one, and that certainly looks like it was changed a very long time ago. So this is clearly broken down at some point in the dim and distant past. Now the other thing I really wanted to show you here is this relay. That relay apparently is of a type which is designed for use in 
very safe systems. It's intended one of its applications was for um, nuclear power station monitoring. Well, God help us all if they monitor nuclear power stations with these relays. Very troublesome, that relay. The effect it can have is that intermittently the unit won't work because some of the supply rails are missing. Typically, uh, a VR 20 volt one, which means 20 volts when the relay is energized, and 15 15 VR will not appear. And it's because some of the contacts are worn or dirty on this relay. And you can pop the lid off with a little care. There's a little tab there. You can pop the lid off, clean the relay contacts, respring them a little bit if necessary, because it's more or less impossible to buy that relay type. It's unless you wired a different type of relay and did all the um, wiring changes. It's a 20 volt coil with six normally open contacts. Right, let's drop the um, power supply back in. We'll reconnect these and we'll see what we get. It's not necessarily my intention I go right through and repair this machine now, but I want to show you some of the things to look out for. There's a big power switch at the back here. So this goes down into the uh, slots there. A little bit fiddly to pull the power cable through at the same time. Don't let that get tangled up anywhere. Yeah, all could have been a little bit easier to get to, couldn't it? This particular one, that uh, back metal support, a little bit bent outwards, which is unusual. I've never seen that before. Perhaps somebody lost their patience with it at some point. Right, that's slotted back in OK. Now, it would be okay to power it up without this metal screening can installed, at least for now, but be aware there are mains voltages there. So I think I will refit the panel. If nothing else, it holds down the power supply. And when we are finished with the power supply, we must remember to refit the uh, cable clamp. I'm not necessarily expecting this machine to burst into life now, but I'm hoping it will work well enough that we can carry on to uh, demonstrate it. This particular one doesn't have a mains plug on, so I'll connect the bare wires to my um, the binding posts on my isolation transformer. Right, main switch off at the back initially. Something else I want to show you here, the plastic work here, this plastic panel shrinks that way, pulling away from the edges here and here, and it can foul these buttons. Now, of course, we don't really need these buttons anymore anyway, but it will foul those buttons. Uh, so at some point in the past, you may find that someone has taken this panel off and filed these out so they end up looking a bit shabby as this one does and that's completely normal for this model design fail okay let's uh, power it up switch it on and we hope to get flashing 8 display good if you find that when the lights are off that some of the segments are stuck on then that can indicate a clock module fault. I'll just power that down and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Got another one here. 
So this is one I've had apart and the reason is that I had failure of one of the ICs in here. So if you find display segments stuck on it can be due to actually leaky um, segments on the display board which is that one there you have to undo these screws and pop it off excuse me um, or it could conceivably be the driver chip which is one here it's um, I forget the model number part number but you can still buy those driver chips or in my case <laughs> it was that one of the CPUs. So there's a 40 pin CPU chip which I'd unsoldered here from this board and fitted it into my working machine. So uh, that can be a nuisance because of course you'd need to scrap one of these panels to get that chip off. And you might say why don't you swap over the entire front panel? And you might get away with that but you might not because there are several revisions of this and not everything is interchangeable with everything. So that's why I had to swap out a 40 pin chip. Fortunately, with my desolder pump, that didn't take terribly long. There's something else I want to show you before we get too involved. There's a PCB at the back here, behind the deck. Uh, one of these. So it has, um, it sits that way around, and you can see there's a connector at the far right, you might be able to see, and a whole bunch of connectors along here and then loads along the bottom, and we'll look at those in a moment underneath. And a common problem is that those connectors, the plastic shrinks, more plastic shrinking problem, and they split and fall off. Uh, so those connectors may need repair, and the way I repair them is I put a cable tie around the affected connectors and then some araldite as well to secure it. And you can make a repair that's at least as good as original, if not rather stronger, actually. And I've also noticed by chance or otherwise, the black connectors are the ones that fall apart most. Not saying I haven't seen the other colours just uh, break up, but the black ones nearly always are broken. So we'll look at those in a moment. Now, this relay, when you switch this unit on, when I've got it powered up, you'll see the relay go click, or you hear it go click, and there should be a satisfying thunk from underneath the deck, and that's the real brakes. And I'll show you the component that does that in a moment. Before we can look at the deck, we need to ease this front panel forward a little bit. Take this large can off, which is a little fiddly. There may be a screening, there may be an earthing wire connecting to this point here. I've seen it on some and missing on others, and this one it isn't. Try not to lose this spacer from the back, which sets the gap here for this board we were talking about a moment ago to the, uh, to the metalwork. And now you can see one of my repairs here. Clearly I've had a play with this machine at some point in the past, and it's got a cable tie on one of the black connectors. So that one is split. Now you have to be a bit careful because you can run out of room. If you put loads of cable ties on these, they'll all hit each other. Some of the locations, there's not enough room to put cable ties on. Or you have to be a bit careful about where the uh, zipping up part goes. But uh, I'm not sure if I outlighted that one as well. This was played with many, many years ago. But that looks okay. Here's the, the deck. Now, a couple of things on the deck I want to show you. If we can get to a better, a better angle. Let me just put this front on before I lose it. <coughs> There's a video head. There are two contacts here which are used for sending the pizza electric voltages to the uh, actuators of the heads because of course it's got dynamic track following. Now what can happen sometimes if there's been a tape snarl up in here, somebody's yanked the tape out, the tape can hop over the top of the heads and just plough its way through all this, ripping these brushes off and this one as well. This is the earth, earthing um, 
contact for the top of the drum, which most video recorders have that actually. So you may have to undo this screw. It's all been set here with this kind of blue goop, but you may have to undo it and reposition these so they run smoothly. This particular drum is not happy. I can hear it binding. I've never had that problem before. It might just be grot. So this thing's been sitting around in the shed for years. Something else to look here, look at here, is a set of contacts and they tell the deck where the loading ring is. So it's very important these contacts uh, are clean because they are they send signals when the deck is in its fully laced and fully unlaced position and without those signals the uh, the, the mechacon will get confused so um, it's worth possibly a little squirt of switch cleaner in this area so there's a pair here which signal that uh, it's fully unlaced and a pair here which are activated now which signal that it's fully laced and a small metal bar or small metal uh, contact which sits on the loading ring so from what I can see that all looks very clean and tidy there's don't see any problem but a squirt of switch cleaner there would be good this is a pinch roller that's covered in mould for some reason on this machine certainly I would clean that before putting the tape anywhere near it now let's have a look underneath at the uh, deck The first thing to check before you do anything else is that the drive belt here is an extremely large thick drive belt it goes from the loading motor to the worm drive here which operates both the eject and the lacing mechanism and if this belt has fallen off or it's slack then the machine is not going to work at all. So that one appears to be in good order here. And Remember I said earlier, this is a satisfying clonk when you switch it on. It comes from this brake actuator here. You can see that. So when it switches on, that'll momentarily engage, and it does something. As well as taking the brakes off for a moment, there's also a contact set here. And that's normally closed, that contact set, so you should find that if you put a multimeter now on that uh, contact set that it's closed and actually the effect is that it grounds a, a wire so we'll just do that quick check of the multimeter that's fine so these contacts should be made yes they are and if I operate this it opens so they're in good order but it's not unknown for that to uh, foul and then of course the actuator won't work because the actuator grounds through there I think. Right, so there's the bottom side here of that PCB I was showing you with all these connectors and these connectors are hellish because they split. Let's pull one off and see if it's in, in reasonable shape. Trying not to damage anything. <clears throat> Well, it's stuck on. It's certainly been on there a long time. You know, I might leave that alone. <laughs> but these connectors, they tend to split. Not that one, it's a different type. That grey one's different. But these black ones in particular split. I think this green one can split as well. Let's have a look at that one. Ah, yeah, it's starting to split there. You might just about be able to see there's the beginnings of a crack along there. And, of course, if these split properly apart, then it won't apply any pressure to the contacts on the PCB and so you get an open circuit weird faults all over the place okay so this black connector has not split and if you pull all of these off it's fairly obvious where they all go back but just be aware apart from the fact that the whole thing can slide in which is annoying just be aware there's one here that's unpopulated so don't think, oh my god, I've missed a connector out. That is normal. Now, 
if you get into a, an argument with the power supply, you can go along here. These are the power supply connectors along this edge. So pick up a ground somewhere, go through the manual and confirm that the supply rails are there. You can actually pick up some of them here anyway that are actually marked plus 20 VR, plus 15 VR. These are all active when the relay is active. So actually, I'll just do a few of those if I can avoid dropping the whole machine on the floor. Okay. Switch it on, we should hear this relay go clonk. No. Okay, so I'm waiting to see when I power this up if that relay engages. No. So we have a fault. It says CAS, that's correct. Oh, the relay must work. How did that work? Okay, so what's going on here is when I'm pressing on, the relay is not powering up, and it should do. But when I'm pressing cassette, which is eject, the relay is powering up. Well, that's completely wrong. So what I should be able to do is power the machine up, press the on button, the relay should click in, then I should be able to monitor these voltages. Now, for some strange reason on this particular machine, the uh, relay is only kicking in when I press cassette. So I will do that, <clears throat> and then we'll check these voltages here. All the ones that are marked VR are active when the relay is clicked in. It will doubtlessly click out after a few seconds because there isn't a tape in there. No click, as it should be from the relay. Now we're getting weird things. So let's check. 15 volts this line should be here. 15 is. 20 volts here. If I've measured that correctly. That's the 20 volt position there. Then there's a 33 volt. Well, those voltage seem about right. And there's a 5 volt here. Again, I'll have to engage that. Get the relay to engage. Oh, there's 5 volts. So why is the relay not switching on when it's being asked to? Well, when it should be asked to. What happens is one side of the relay is held at around about 20 volts and the other side is grounded by the electronics on the front panel. So the driving signal for the relay comes in on pin 3 of the power supply so it's presently high, 15 volts or so and it goes low when it's selected by that button but it's supposed to be on at all times so this blue wire here, pin 3, which comes from the clock timer module at the front is not energizing the machine when it should be uh, and that's my fault and I dare say the fault actually is in the front panel or maybe a connector somewhere, so I could go through all of those. So that gives you an idea how to start uh, fault finding on one of these machines. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to mention, which was, I'll make sure it's powered down. We looked earlier at the contacts on the video head here. So we have these contacts here for the um, pizza actuator 
and the earthing one. Now, if the earthing one isn't making, this, if this one's got bent or just not making good contact, you'll get stripes with lots and lots of dots in the picture. So that's um, a definite fault to look for. Fortunately, though, the actual mechanism is pretty robust. So apart from checking for the contacts we've mentioned earlier, uh, mechanical problems are relatively rare. Um, here we have the capstan motor, which is driven from this small DC motor here by a drive belt, which if you're sharp-eyed, you will have seen has snapped. So, let's see if we fish it out with a pair of cutters. So that's a, an obvious, obvious repair to do. How to do it? Well, undo these screws, I think. I've not uh, looked at that for some time but it can't be that hard to change that belt, can it? A few other small things I wanted to show you. Um, this machine only partly works, so it's a little difficult to show, but I wanted to explain, firstly, if this machine was powered up and you put the tape in there and it sits there and nothing happens, then I would be looking at the missing 20 volt supply. If, on the other hand, it goes down, but then, now this machine's gonna do weird things, it goes down and you can select play, but the take up spool does not take up the spool of uh, the tape from the deck so it spills out. And also you finish up with loops of tape lying around, then that would imply that uh, the uh, spool drive is low or missing, and that would very often be the 15 volt rail is missing. And another thing I wanted to show you was eject. If you eject the tape, this one's making some horrible noises. It can come out very slowly like that. And in fact, it usually will, and it needs a bit of a tug. There's some grease on the um, eject mechanism here on either side. The grease set's rather sticky and thick. Clean it off and replace it with um, something like Vaseline petroleum jelly. If you miss out the grease completely, then it'll catapult the cassette halfway across the room. So few um, of the small mechanical things there uh, and <clears throat> I'll switch this off that's off when you're finished working on here don't forget to put the uh, screening can back on for which you'll have to pull the front off a little bit and it's a bit of a task now be careful you don't crumple with the back of this you don't crumple this piece of card the worst case scenario is if this thing disappears and it often can it's a spacer and if this card is missing there's a hazard that that board will touch this metal and um, you'll certainly blow things up properly if that happens I'm getting into just that trouble there we go that is just that thing I was explaining look the card can slip downhill here. Don't want that situation. In fact, this piece of card here is folded over. It's a funny old arrangement, isn't it? Hmm. It may have been folded, but manufacturer, I suspect. <sighs> so, battle with that generally, but make sure that you have the insulation between the screening can and the back panel, that back motor driver board. When you first see one of these, the door is open, and of course on most machines, VHS and Beta, the door would, would normally be closed if there's no tape in there. But on this model, it sort of sits there. It's quite strange. The door closes when there's a tape inside to stop you accidentally inserting another tape. Plastic shrinking problem can do all kinds of things, like the Grundig badge here can be warped, but it's only cosmetic.
Now I did mention earlier about how uh, the capacitors on the power supply here should be low ESR types and you can get patterning on the screen if they're uh, in poor condition or they've been replaced with non low ESR ones and another problem can be that the servos struggle to lock so you can get weird problems with um, poor tracking or uh, hunting and one final look at the mechanism and the board beneath a lot of these strange little connectors which if we take a look at one of these this is a power supply one so as well as these pins being connectors for the power supply PCB that sits on the motherboard they also double up as uh, connector points for this cable which goes to the front control panel and you can see the control panel it's worth mentioning you think you're doing something wrong here because the control panel can often look quite warped if you can adjust you slightly so that PCB is bent uh, this is probably again due to uh, plastic uh, contraction problems it may not have been bent at manufacture but it's quite common to see that all twisted up this switch here um, which one is that? There's several switches they tell the machine what the tape length is as well as whether the record tabs are switched on and off here so there are idents in here for whether the record is enabled or disabled I've just switched that over and I can't seem to switch it back again so we've got three locations there and the center one there tells it whether or not recording is allowed so I believe the outer two tell it the, the running time and on this model it actually comes up with the running time uh, so we can calculate the uh, not only the running time from the start of the tape but the amount of tape left approximately in hours and minutes to the end of the cassette it doesn't have um, a tape counter in the way that some of the more sophisticated VHS and beta ones do which count pulses on the tape and therefore know how much recording is on the tape it only knows where it is physically is on the cassette looking at the length of the tape and the relative speeds of the two spools go on then can you turn the tape around for me please Max <laughs> go on, turn it around <laughs> upside down turn it upside down that's it Press the play button. So, if you're wondering what the problems were that I originally had with this machine, they were, firstly, the display went mad with stuck and repeating characters. When I switched the machine off and then on, it would not accept a tape. I, of course, reasonably believed that these two faults had been connected in some way, since the machine had been working fine for the last several years. That caused me to go on a bit of a wild goose chase. The two faults were utterly unrelated random breakdowns, which happened at almost the same time. The garbled display was caused by IC280, which is one of the two CPU chips on the front panel PCB. Swapping the whole panel over resulted in a machine that acted very strangely, because it was probably incompatible with my version of the machine but swapping over just that IC sorted the, the display. No operation was caused by the 20VR line being missing due to poor contacts in the power supply relay. I fixed that by cleaning the relay contacts, but then lost real drive in play because the 15VR line was now missing. Respringing more relay contacts fixed that. The relay is unfortunately uh, pretty much impossible to obtain. Uh, contacts needed cleaning on the brake actuator solenoid. This is the one that makes a satisfying clonk when you switch the machine on. Uh, there were some problems with connectors splitting on the motor driver board. And finally, the earthing contact on the head top needed respringing too. 
than reassembling and testing. Well, I hope you've uh, enjoyed learning something about this uh, video recorder, the Grundig 2x4 Super. Uh, please do like, share and especially subscribe so then I'll do more audio and video technology um, material in the future. Bye for now.